This is Dionysus, depicted as a crucified figure. Timothy Freak and Peter Gandy feature a picture of this amulet on the cover of their book, The Jesus Mysteries. However, this amulet dates centuries after the first century AD. Concerning Dionysus turning water into wine, one historical and theological study explained. The ancient literature says that there was a spring with clear, sparkling, wine-colored, very pleasant-tasting water in which the newly born Dionysus was bathed. Also, a spring in the temple flowed with wine. At Elis, the priests of Dionysus placed three large empty cauldrons in a sealed room to find them filled with wine when they returned the next day. However, from these references, it is obvious that there are significant differences between the Dionysus legend and the story in John 2. The spring flowed with water, and the one at Andros flowed with wine, not wine that had once been water. And the empty cauldrons in the Ellis Temple were filled with wine, rather than water subsequently changed into wine, key elements in John's story. These differences have convinced most scholars that John or his tradition is not dependent on the Dionysus legend for this story. The available accounts of Dionysus's birth indicate that Dionysus was not born of a virgin. Again, there are multiple versions of this myth. In the best known myth, however, Dionysus was born through an affair between Zeus and a princess. In another version, Zeus mated with his daughter, Persephone, and she bore Dionysus. In the first version, Dionysus was saved as a fetus in the underworld, and in the second, his heart was saved. Both the heart and the fetus were brought to Zeus, and Dionysus was born a second time by Zeus making him the twice-born god. Thus, Dionysus was neither resurrected nor born of a virgin. This is Mithra, who was born when he emerged from a cave not a virgin birth like Jesus. In his book, Image and Value in the Greco-Roman World, Richard Gordon writes that there is no death of Mithras, and thus there is no resurrection of Mithra. Even the Encyclopedia Britannica concedes that Mithraism could not have influenced the Gospel writers. It states, There is little notice of the Persian god Mithra in the Roman world until the beginning of the second century. But, from the year A.D. 136 onward, there are hundreds of dedicatory inscriptions to Mithra. This renewal of interest is not easily explained. The most plausible hypothesis seems to be that Roman Mithraism was practically a new creation. The four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written well before the close of the first century. If Mithraism wasn't even known in the Roman world in the first century, as the Encyclopedia Britannica stated, then it is misguided to suggest that teachings regarding Mithra influenced the New Testament writers. As for resurrections, academic scholars of religion acknowledge that there is no evidence for the belief that any of these mythical deities were believed to have risen from the dead prior to the time of the New Testament and Jesus. Dr. Walter Burkert, a Greek religion scholar and author, stated, There is no evidence for a resurrected Attis. Even Osiris remains with the dead. Any allegations of 16 other saviors who all resemble the same characteristics of Jesus is most likely based on the book entitled The World's 16 Crucified Saviors by Kersey Graves. This book is an unreliable source. Even atheist Richard Carrier criticized, The world's 16 crucified saviors is unreliable, but no comprehensive critique exists. Most scholars immediately recognize many of his findings as unsupported and dismiss graves as useless. After all, a scholar who rarely cites a source isn't useful to have as a reference, even if he is right. Dr. Norman Geisler wrote, the only known account of a god surviving death that predates Christianity is the Egyptian cult god Osiris. In this myth, Osiris is cut into 14 pieces, scattered around Egypt, 
then reassembled and brought back to life by the goddess Isis. However, Osiris did not actually come back to physical life, but became a member of the shadowy underworld. This is far different than Jesus' resurrection account, where he was the gloriously risen prince of life, who was seen by others on earth before his ascension into heaven. Even if there are myths about dying and rising gods prior to Christianity, that doesn't mean the New Testament writers copied from them. Even atheists and non-Christian scholars have rejected this idea that Christianity has been borrowed from ancient myths. The well-respected Sir Edward Evans Pritchard wrote, The evidence for this theory is negligible. In sum, skeptic claims of Christianity being borrowed from ancient Egypt, India, Greece, and Persia can be disregarded as false because there are no primary sources for these parallels predating A.D. 150. This is more than 100 years after the origin of Christianity. Before A.D. 100, all of the mystery religions were still mostly confined to localities, but after A.D. 100, they gradually began to attain popularity throughout the Roman Empire. Many writers used the late source material produced in this period, after A.D. 150, to form reconstructions of what they think the cults must have been earlier to their spread in the Roman Empire. So if there was any influence of one on the other, it was the influence of the historical events of the New Testament on mythology, not the reverse. Peter wrote, We have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Critics note that the sacred day of worship of the pagan god Mithra was Sunday, as if Christianity had stolen this Sunday worship. However, Jews and Jesus celebrated the Sabbath on Saturday, the seventh day of the week, just as God spoke through Moses. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor, and do all thy work. But the seventh day, Saturday, is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. The early Christians worshipped Jesus daily, not just on Saturday and Sunday. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. In the early 4th century, it was Constantine who made Sunday a rest day. His Sunday law of March 7, A.D. 321 read, On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in the cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. And what about the date of December 25th? Did the New Testament writers steal the birthday of Jesus from the myth of pagan gods? Author Acharya S. suggests in her book, The Christ Conspiracy, that the sun dies for three days at the winter solstice, to be born again or resurrected on December 25th. The commonly accepted story is that Jesus was born on December 25th, not that he died, was born again, or resurrected, as Acharya S. parallels. But nowhere in the Holy Bible do we find any reference to the birth of Jesus being on December 25th. This date of December 25th was chosen later in A.D. 354 by Roman Bishop Liberius, based on pagan thought and the Roman tradition of Saturnalia, rather than on biblical truth. The Christmas tree also has its roots in pagan tree worship. Babylonian myths told of an evergreen tree which sprang out of a dead tree stump. The old stump symbolized the dead Nimrod, and the new tree symbolized that Nimrod had come back to life again in Tammuz. In Rome, the sacred fir tree was decorated with red berries. Christmas and Christmas trees have nothing to do with Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, God condemns the pagan practices of Christmas through his prophet Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain, for one cuts a tree.